the end of World War I, he persuaded. In 19th, having as president 17 years, Masaryk is succeeded by Edward Benish, a long-time associate, and here is the only country in Central in a democratic form of government. While freedom flourishes in Czechoslovakia, tyranny takes money. Adler is firmly in power. The Czechs give up the Sudetenland, a million German speculation or military. Czechoslovakia will not yield, he says. And he orders a mobilization of the country's military forces while pleading with England and France to join in hurling back any German attempt to seize the Sudetenland. At this critical moment in history, Adler plays host to a fateful meeting in Munich. England, France, and Italy give it Chamberlain signs the ill-fated for England. Then Italy's Benito Mussolini adds his name, and Premier Edouard Daladier of France is the last of the big four to sign. Czechoslovakia is not even represented. Neville Chamberlain is jubilant on his return to London. He has negotiated in good faith. He has achieved peace, and now he can say... We regard the agreement signed last night, the Anglo-German nation, as symbolic of the two peoples never to go to war with one another again. But Adolf Hitler has no intention of honoring the Munich Pact. After sending his troops into the Sudetenland in October 1938, the German Führer scraps the treaty completely five months later. He annexes Czechoslovakia by setting up a puppet government in Slovakia and making Bohemia and Moravia protectorates of the Third Reich. Edward Benesch resigns as president and goes into exile. Then, in his mountain retreat at Berchtesgaden, Adolf Hitler makes a fateful miscalculation. He invades Poland, confident that England and France will not intervene. But this time, they do, and he makes Europe is plunged into World War II. In London, a Czechoslovakian government in exile has been set up with Edward Benesch as its head. For five years, the determined Czech leader keeps the dream of Czech independence alive. Visiting the United States, Benish receives a promise from President Roosevelt that America will support Czechoslovakia's restoration at war's end. Joseph Stalin agrees too, but only after gaining important territorial concessions in exchange for Russian backing of Czech autonomy. By April of 1945, Hitler's legions are in full retreat. In Prague, street fighting breaks out. Czech patriots rise up against countrymen who have collaborated with the hated Nazis. The avenues of the picturesque capital city become a no-man's land as Prague awaits its liberation. First to enter are the Russians. Allied commanders have ordered America's General Patton to remain on the outskirts of the city while the Soviet troops make their triumphal entry. The last symbols of the German occupation are put to the torch and purged from Prague. And Edward Benesch returns on May 8, 1945. Hopes are high that he can restore a representative and democratic government. The crowd does not know, nor can President Beto, that Czechoslovakia's newly regained independence will be short-lived. The documentary held in 1946 show the nation to be 70 anti-communist, but the cops are able to take control of the state machinery. And in February 1948, the Czech parliament agrees to the formation of a coalition government headed by a hardline communist, Clement Gottwald. In May, Gottwald holds national elections with only communist candidates on the ballot. A month later, Edward Benesch resigns for a second time. The Iron Curtain rolls across Czechoslovakia and the nation joins the communist bloc in Eastern Europe. Freedom is dead. 
and so too is Edward Vanish, three short months after his resignation. Grief is etched in every face as liberty-loving Czechs file past their fallen leader. An era has ended, and with it, a nation's struggle for self-determination. The new communist regime pursues a rigid and repressive policy. Clement Gottwald nationalizes industry, collectivizes farming, makes police terror the law of the land, and repeatedly denounces the United States for her alleged imperialism. The Red Leader follows the Moscow line faithfully until his death in 1953. When Nikita Khrushchev comes to call, he is greeted by Gottwald's successor, Antonin Novotny. The new Czech leader insists Khrushchev and communism with fervor and feeling. Breaking bread with his host, Khrushchev offers a pledge of support and unity. But the crowds who see and hear the Soviet premier are reminded and forcefully of Czechoslovakia's satellite status and allegiance to Moscow. The country becomes more and more a police state. Novotny adheres strictly to the dictates of his Russian masters. He strengthens Czech military might, but he also plunges the nation's once robust economy into chaos. In the age-old competition between guns and butter, there are too many guns and not enough butter. Unrest grows, dissatisfaction spreads. Communists of the Czech parliament begin to express openly their resentment at Novotny's hard line. They talk of a new liberalized form of communism, a kind of democratic socialism. The parliamentary revolt comes to a head in March, 1968. Novotny is forced to resign. Mastermind of the bloodless coup is Alexander Dubček, leader of the liberal forces. For a few short months, Czechoslovakia undergoes a remarkable transformation. The people are promised a new government that will guarantee free speech and the secret ballot. To stimulate business, Dubček and his reformers pledge a speedy return to a liberalized economy. The daring and dramatic actions find a quick acceptance and positive response from the Czech people. The fabric of their lives takes on a new look as they sample and take to themselves many of the ways of the West. No innovation is more stunning and striking than the fashion creations of Czech designers. A new light has been kindled and its glow illuminates many shapes and forms. The nature of communism is changing in Czechoslovakia and the change threatens to spread throughout the rest of Eastern Europe as well. And so while the Czechs do and say and promise things unheard of behind the Iron Curtain, the free world waits and wonders just how far the Soviet Union will let the satellite nation go in its pursuit of democratic socialism. The answer comes in July 1968 when leaders of the two nations meet at a Czech border town. President Podgorny, Party Secretary Brezhnev, Premier Kosygin, and Mikhail Suslov, party theoretician, lead the Russian delegation. Czechoslovakia is represented by all the members of its ruling hierarchy, including Premier Chernik, Party Secretary Dubček, and President Svoboda. In a tense face-to-face -face confrontation, the Soviet leaders make it very plain that they view the democratization of Czechoslovakia as a betrayal of the basic communist doctrine.
But Dubček is adamant, and seemingly he wins his point. Russia agrees not to interfere with the reform leaders and their liberalized programs. News of the Soviet action shakes the communist and free worlds. Little David has defied mighty Goliath. Within a week, the other Warsaw Pact nations, Bulgaria, East Germany, Hungary, and Poland, meet in Bratislava to ratify the Russian-Czech agreement. Walter Ulbricht, East Germany's red leader, is among the signers. Poland's Vladislav Gomulka follows as President Svoboda looks on. The ceremonies provide a who's who of European communism. But the Czechs and the Russians are the star players in the drama at Bratislava. It is, some say, too good to be true. But Dubček is confident. The Soviet leaders have given their word. The conference ends and the news goes out that Czechoslovakia is free to continue its experiment in democratic socialism. Two communist comrades in arms say goodbye, go their separate ways. That night, crowds jam Prague airport to hail President Svoboda and party leader Dubček on their return from Bratislava. Fears and tensions, anxieties and apprehensions are swept away as Dubček tells his countrymen, there is only one path and that is forward. This is a night to remember, a milestone in Czechoslovakia's long and painful march to self-determination. The aim have been rekindled, a spirit of hope has been reborn. Then, on another night, less than three weeks later, the embers are stamped out. The spirit is crushed. The service bulletin flashes the word to an unbelieving world. Russia and her Warsaw Pact allies have sent troops and tanks into Czechoslovakia to put an end to the democratization of the nation. The nightmare of the Nazi occupation is relived with all of its grim and terrible consequences. People awake to re end of the death of a dream. Czechoslovakia is once more in the merciless grip of the communist bosses in the Kremlin. How long the Soviet imprint will remain, only the men in Moscow know. But one thing is certain, Czechoslovakia and her people must wait for another time, another day, to reclaim the freedom that is their history and heritage. As another contribution to the community's Community Federal Savings and Loan Association has been pleased to bring you this chapter of living history. Community Federal Savings and Loan, the financial partner in the growth and development of Palm Beach County.